I spent two days at the biggest gathering of Christian nationalists, far-right commentators, politicians, and supporters. I walked 14 miles, had countless conversations, and listened to hours of speeches and interviews. Some moments genuinely shocked me, while others surprised me in a good way. This video is a recap of what I learned and why I believe that the rhetoric espoused in these spaces should concern all of us. Welcome to the New Evangelicals YouTube channel. I'm Tim Whitaker. Let's dive in. Before I unpack my time at the event, and trust me, there's a lot to unpack, I first want to give a few caveats. First, when it comes to the organization of the New Evangelicals, we have a very hard line of non-dehumanization. What this means is that we do our best not to make fun of people or belittle them. We believe that everyone is made in the image of God and deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. Yes, this can be difficult, especially with people and organizations that we not only think are problematic, but we see the impact of the rhetoric affecting our neighbors. However, once we cross that line, we then end up on the same path that the people we're critiquing are on. And ultimately, we believe that dehumanization eventually leads to violence, which we are strongly opposed to. The reason I'm allowed into events like this and the reason why people will talk to me is because they know I'm there in good faith. A lot of my conversations are off the record. I'm not here to name drop or to blow someone up online for saying something. My goal of attending this event is to get a finger on the pulse and to better understand what drives the movement that we see. I will share clips were applicable of live stream speakers or clips of speakers I recorded, but I will not be sharing the names of people I spoke to in conversation. I told them I was there in good faith and they spoke to me off the record and I'm not here to betray that trust. Let's face it, anyone can watch Tucker Carlson or Candace Owens online, but you can't really get the feel of what drives all of it unless you're there in person. So I was with 10,000 plus people. What are the concerns? What is the fuel that drives the anger we see on stage? What are the values and religious convictions that this is all built on? America Fest, hosted by Turning Point USA, is a good place to start considering the sheer size and scope of who attends. I also want to thank all of the people who talked to me and who treated me cordially and with respect. If you're watching this video, I hope you feel the same despite our massive disagreements. You knew who I was, you knew that I speak loudly in opposition to the political and spiritual views of organizations like Turning Point USA, and you welcomed the conversation anyway. Many of you thanked me for being willing to have it. A sincere thank you for being so hospitable. I need to acknowledge that yes, as a white man, I do have an immense amount of privilege when it comes to being in spaces like this. I'm also what I call Theo bro passing, and so I'm able to speak the language fluently. Because I grew up conservative, evangelical, and deeply embedded in movements like this, I understand how they function, and part of how I use my privilege is that I go to these events to better understand them and then report back. The intent of this video is to be honest. I'm not here to spread misinformation or propaganda. We might interpret the data differently, but it's data nonetheless. This is not primarily a response video, although I will be responding to some things. This is about what I experienced at the largest Christian national nationalist gathering in the U.S. in hopes of informing you, the viewer, so you really understand what's going on. It can be too easy to dismiss events like this as fringe, especially for my more moderate conservative Christian friends. This video is also for you. Like it or not, Turning Point is a massive organization that attracts thousands of people in person and millions online. They have hundreds of people on staff and are one of the main drivers pushing the GOP farther to the right. And lastly, I'm only one person, okay? I didn't hear everything, so please don't take this video as an exhaustive list of everything that was or was not said. Turning Point USA was started over a decade ago by Charlie Kirk. He's 30 years old, worth millions of dollars, and is a very driven individual. He's also very intelligent, and this is very important to note because I hear too many people online resort to childlike name calling. He's a moron. He's so dumb. No, he actually knows quite a lot and is very strategic. How many other people in their 20s built a multi-million dollar organization that has the ability to directly impact federal elections? Now, of course, I think what Turning Point is doing is incredibly dangerous and harmful. And yes, I believe too often they peddle and have truths and deny straight up facts, like for example, that the 2020 election was not stolen, which will come up repeatedly in this video, but we have to deal honestly here. Dumb is not a good word to use. To give you an idea, 
idea of how big this organization is, they raised $138 million between 2016 and 2021. In 2020 alone, about half of its income came from 10 anonymous donors, and last year they raised $80 million. This is not a small organization, okay? Turning Point is the mothership and has two other organizations underneath of it. Turning Point Action is their 501c4 political arm, and Turning Point Faith is, as the name suggests, their faith arm. Of course, by faith, they mean the Christian faith. More on that later on. All three arms of the organization are very present at America Fest and work together to push a movement that is part far-right rhetoric, part Christian, and part high school and college age driven. Inside of the Turning Point world are many other smaller subsidiaries. There's Turning Point Academy, which according to their website is a, quote, educational movement that exists to glorify God and preserve the founding principles of the United States through influencing and inspiring the formation of the next generation. They use the three three R's to describe their goals, reclaim, revive, and restore. And you can find a Turning Point Academy grade school in places like Dream City Church, a mega church in the Phoenix area. This and more is all present at America Fest, which is pretty much the Super Bowl for Turning Point USA. And in my opinion, it's the Super Bowl of Christian nationalism. Let's get into why. I can't express enough to you how absolutely massive this event is. There's a huge media space with dozens of booths that are podcasting, live streaming, and interviewing people all day. This is not your typical media, by the way. You're not going to find CNN or ABC News here. In fact, you won't even find Fox News here. Instead, you'll find media organizations like Flashpoint, which claims to tackle topics that mainstream media does not while giving commentary in the spirit of faith, and other organizations like Valuetainment, a quote, news site that says they are here to enlighten, entertain, and empower current and future leaders around the world, which somehow includes interviewing the U.S. Capitol rioter Shaman, who spent time in prison for trying to subvert the election process. Other far right media organizations like The Blaze and Breitbart were also there. There's also a massive sponsor hall filled with everything from doTERRA representatives to Liberty University to a whole booth dedicated to, quote, freeing the January 6th prisoners of war that are currently being prosecuted for their involvement in the January 6th insurrection. There's even a book you could buy called the American Gulag Chronicles. And there were also plenty of sponsors there that are part of the parallel economy. This parallel economy is an attempt for conservatives to only shop at Patriot-owned businesses instead of giving money to leftist organizations like Target, for example. In the more conspiratorial spaces of the far right, there's a motivation to build this economy so when the current system fails, there will be an alternative one ready to go. I didn't hear that directly mentioned from the stage, but it has been pretty well documented in various news articles. The CEO of Public Square, Michael Seifert, did speak on the main stage pushing this concept. We've had employees match with employers that don't hate them. We've had folks move their banks to banks that they know they can feel a blessed assurance that they're not going to cancel them. We have had entire towns transformed by what's happening in Public Square. And the beauty is, you know, we're just getting started. In less than 18 months, this platform already hit a million members faster than Twitter, Airbnb, Spotify. The movement of the parallel economy is growing. Power structures of society are being shifted back toward we the people, and all it takes is starting with a shift of your spending for one item. Pick an item. I bought this watch from Public Square. I bought my socks from Public Square. I got a coffee from a Public Square business. You start somewhere, and you will find over time that more and more of your purchases are weapons in this economic war that will shift the power structures of our country back to the values of we the people. You get to be on the forefront. You get to make change. You have a wallet. It's time to wield it. Sound good? Public Square is an online marketplace that is home to 40,000 businesses. Users can shop for almost anything via their app to support Patriot-owned products, and according to Michael, it's the third largest economy in the world by GDP. Now, I was not able to fact check that statement, but regardless, it's a thing, and there are many companies ready to convert people to their alternatives. I mean, why use Verizon when you can use Patriot Mobile? Why get healthcare from the man when you can use American healthcare? You want coffee? Forget Starbucks, buy Patriot Coffee, or Loaded Gun Coffee, invest with companies like Fisher Capital, whose website has Roger Stone, a man caught on camera, talking about the plan to push the stolen election narrative before the election happened on the company's website. You get the picture. I'll be honest, in a weird way, this event is pretty wide in terms of political views. If your starting point is Mitt Romney is not a true conservative, you can start there and move to the right. And kick out the Romneys, the Paul Ryans from the Republican Party once and for all. 
For example, there was a booth handing out pamphlets that cast out on what really happened on 9-11. I'm not joking. And this is a sentiment that has been echoed by Turning Point backed presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy. What is the truth about January 6th? I don't know, but we to? can handle it. Whatever it is, we can handle it. But what government is it? agents, how many government agents were in the field? Right? You mean like entrapment? Yeah. It, absolutely. Why can the government not be transparent about something that we're using? Terrorist, or the kind of tactic used by terrorists, if we find that there are hundreds of our own in the ranks of the day that they were, that they were, I mean, Look, well, there's a difference between entrapment and the difference between a law enforcement agent I, I, I identifying think, I, think I think it is legitimate to say how many police, how many federal agents were on the planes that hit the Twin Towers. Like, I think we want it. Maybe the answer is zero. Probably a zero, for all I know, right? I have no reason to think it was anything other than zero. But if we're doing a comprehensive assessment of what happened on 9-11, we have a 9-11 commission, absolutely that should be an answer the public knows the answer to. The shaman who stormed the Capitol building and who led a prayer to Jesus inside the chambers was also there. I'm not kidding about this either, and he was treated like a celebrity. Oh, he's also running for Congress in Arizona. Now, to be clear, I talked to several people who saw the guy as crazy and not serious, but regardless, the event organizers did not think he was dangerous enough to bar him from attending. He took photos with people, was interviewed live by Valuetainment, like I mentioned earlier, and for some, seen as a true patriot for what he did, which, to be very clear, he was arrested and sentenced to 41 months for his role in the January 6th insurrection. He was released early and despite telling a judge that he was taking accountability for his actions and that yes, he did break the law, he had no problem being treated like royalty at an event where people celebrated him for doing exactly that. And this is why I call America Fest a far right event. Conservative is too broad and many conservatives would not be welcomed here by the crowd or many of the speakers. Liz Cheney, for example, even though she voted with Trump 93% of the time, would never be asked to speak at an event like this because she be considered a traitor to America for her role in exposing Trump during the January 6th hearings. This event isn't about being conservative. It's about pushing the conservative movement farther to the right. A massive focus this year at America Fest was a push to take over the Republican Party. These Republicans need to feel the heat of the grassroots. And do you want to know the good news, everybody? The good news is that you get it, but your leaders don't. You want results. You want a border more than you want Zelensky to get more billions of dollars. You are repulsed when you see that go-go dancer show up with the turtle and Chuck U. Schumer and demand more of your taxpayer dollars while we are being invaded on a daily basis. I find it insulting that Senate Republicans have been able to get $200 billion to Ukraine while we cannot secure the southern border. You want an end to the medical child mutilation of our children that is called trans surgery. Period. If you follow politics at all, you can see this already happening. The GOP has people like Chris Christie and Vivek Ramaswamy and Trump inside of it. Yet they couldn't be farther apart on major wedge issues like the 2020 election, healthcare for trans people, and abortion. Turning Point recognizes this and is putting a lot of effort in mobilizing their base to put pressure on the RNC to head in the direction of Trump and Trumpism through their political arm, Turning Point Action. In fact, to make it very clear just how sick of the RNC they are, next year, Turning Point Action is launching the People's Convention to compete with the RNC's National Convention. It's clear to me, at least, that Turning Point point is laser focused on making sure Trumpism is here to stay and that the word conservative is redefined to be only farther to the right. Let's not forget that before Trump, Mitt Romney was the RNC presidential candidate. Today, he's largely erased from the movement and called a rhino. For more evidence of this, Turning Point Action held a breakout session explaining their scorecard system and how it works. The scorecard puts Congress on a spectrum between patriot and tyrant, and the more you vote with Turning Point USA as a politician, the closer you get to being a patriot, and the less you vote with them, the closer you get to being a tyrant. This scorecard is updated in real time, which honestly is very impressive, so followers can see how the representative is voting on key political issues. They also rank entire states, so for example, New Jersey, which is my state, ranks very low with a 22.59 out of 100 according to Turning Point Action, which means my state is becoming tyrannical. Compare that to Texas, which is ranked 71.27, giving them the quote, losing freedom rank. They rank states on different categories 
categories, including medical freedom, which they define by saying that every American born and unborn has the right to a healthy life. But I don't think this means what you or I think it means. For example, despite New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy signing an executive order to protect gender-affirming care, which, by the way, studies do show that gender-affirming care reduces the risk of suicide, New Jersey is given a 22.59, quote, medical freedom scorecard, according to Turning Point Action. New Jersey is also a pro-choice state, which means if a fetus is diagnosed with Edwards syndrome, also known as trisomy 18, a condition in which 90 to 95% of babies do not live beyond the first year, with most tragically dying in the first two weeks, and even more tragically, half of those pregnancies with this condition will lead to a stillborn birth, the family has the final say in how they move forward in the pregnancy. In other words, they have the freedom to make a very difficult decision instead of a state making it for them. Strangely enough, Texas, according to Turning Point, scores 88% on medical freedom despite greatly limiting the right to gender-affirming care access, and that is so strict on abortion, it literally forced a woman to seek an abortion out of state for her pregnancy that not only had Edwards syndrome, but also had a high chance of impacting her future fertility and health make it make sense. Now, to be very clear, I do agree that our elected leaders should be held accountable and a real-time scorecard is, like I said, very impressive. It's a great idea. I also understand that Turning Point has political perspectives. We all do. It's just hard to understand the logic of how it all works. How is a state that restricts healthcare access more patriotic in a state that allows more healthcare access, tyrannical. Speaking of sense, I gotta say, it was really hard to find consistency in the rhetoric. It was whiplash all over the place. And I found myself agreeing in moments only to ask myself, wait, I thought this was a liberal talking point. Take this clip from Charlie Kirk, for example. But this revolution is when the powerful, the rich, the wealthy decide to use their power and their wealth to go after you. Instead of building hospitals and improving our country, they are spending their money to destroy the greatest country ever to exist in the history of the world. What makes this movement different is that you are here as a grassroots response to the top-down revolution happening in this country. You are here as teachers, as mothers, as students. I what does he think the Occupy Wall Street movement was? When people say that it's an injustice that corporate profits exploded during the pandemic and wages have been behind for decades, would Charlie not agree with that? The top 1% do own 26.5% of America's wealth compared to the middle class that own 26%, which represents, by the way, 60% of Americans. But when people talk like this, it's labeled socialism and therefore bad. Last point on this, I would agree that ultra-rich people are not using their wealth to make the country better by building hospitals, etc., which is why we need a government to enforce fair tax laws. A stable, accountable government is very important for a flourishing society. But again, the rhetoric here is whiplash. Big government sucks, but we need to take over the GOP to get our champion in office so he can drain the swamp, which you can only do by using government power. It seems like it's not really about smaller government anymore. It's more about who gets to wield the power and sword of the government. When liberals are in power, the government is a Marxist dystopian nightmare and out of control with big government spending, but when it's their conservative champions, it's peaceful, prosperous, and virtuous. But it's important to note, nonetheless, how similar the language can be at times, yet with very different perspectives on how to solve the issue. I would also say that in my experience, America Fest was focused way more on particular culture war issues than it was economic policy or solving actual problems. Even issues like immigration, a huge focus at the event, was pretty mum on the solutions other than typical rhetoric like, Joe Biden wants open borders and Trump will close the borders, which, by the way, he did not, because, again, it's more complicated than that. And this brings us to a major talking point espoused at the event that should truly concern us, the Great Replacement Theory. This is a conspiracy theory that says there are forces at work that are intentionally flooding our borders with non-white immigrants to destroy the fabric of our society. Who is behind this? The deep state? Some secret cabal? The liberals, cultural Marxism, who knows, honestly, but it exists and it's happening. And no, I'm not lying when I tell you this was out in the open. The greatest cities in America. Oh, yeah. And it is Easy. the perfect example of the great replacement, a city that was safe and was peaceful. And then you bring in a bunch of third worlders that don't share our values with tolerance and it gets destroyed. There's a, there, there's a couple topics I want to keep diving into here. And one of them is the people who should be most against this importation of Muslims into our country. 
Charlie was talking about Minneapolis here, and the first thing you should know is that Minneapolis doesn't even crack the top 10 or 15 most dangerous city list. And the second thing you should know is that a study done by the Cato Institute revealed that in 2018, native-born citizens were twice as likely to commit a crime, including sex crimes, than undocumented immigrants. And this is a good example of how much I heard was just propaganda. And it's effective because the audience doesn't know enough to challenge it and believes everything that is said from the stage. And I need to say that the Great Replacement Theory has deep roots in white supremacy. David Duke, a former Grand Wizard of the KKK, praised Tucker Carlson in 2021 for talking about the Replacement Theory on his show, saying in part, quote, Tucker Carlson is talking about Replacement Theory. Well, I knew it was going on way back then, way back in 1991. If you've ever wondered how groups like the KKK grew to millions of members, you should know that its rhetoric lives on and Big organizations that also attract millions of people today. Joe Biden's 5 million illegal aliens are on the verge of replacing you. The government of this country is on course to replace us with non-Europeans, non-white people. And coming from all over the world, they're also replacing your culture. All the people coming in, it's even affecting the culture of the country. That's right, they want you to disappear. We need to actually get up and fight for the white race or there ain't gonna be no white race. They care more about the illegal immigrants at the border than they do the American people. They're giving out handouts to them. Our country just don't care about us Americans. It's all about a handout to all the illegal immigrants. If you're white, you have to go to the back of the line discriminating against white people. There is racial discrimination going on right now in this country against massive numbers of white Americans. Anti-racist is a whole weird ideology that, quite frankly, tries to make white people second-class citizens. White Americans are being treated as second-class citizens. There are now two standards of justice. It's a dual system of justice. The foreign-born population is now growing by 132,000 people every month. The non-whites are reproducing rapidly. Eventually, there'll be no more native-born Americans. Our people are having few children. We've got to start protecting our race. How precisely is diversity our strength? So how is diversity our strength? And Trump's persecution complex was prominently on display, and while Trump was not in attendance, Trump Jr. spoke, and so did Trump's lawyer, Alina Habba. I took on the Justice Department. I took on everything having to do with the Russia hoax, the fake FISA warrants that they lied and got, and it was all in a perfect complaint that got assigned to a Clinton-appointed judge. There were probably 50 lawyers representing all of the radical left. It got dismissed, and me and President Trump got sanctioned a million dollars for going against crooked Hillary. Fake news, folks. But unfortunately, the only fake news here is this story. This clip also demonstrates the level of misinformation espoused from the main event speakers that was ready to be believed by the crowd. In regards to this lawsuit that was thrown out, for example, Judge Middlebrooks wrote, quote, Mr. Trump is a prolific and sophisticated litigant who is repeatedly using the courts to seek revenge on political adversaries. He is the mastermind of strategic abuse of the judicial process, and he cannot be seen as a litigant blindly following the advice of a lawyer. Now, some of you might be thinking, but but look, this is a Clinton appointed judge. Two things on this. First, this judge was appointed in 1997, hardly a recent time. And second, it doesn't matter who appointed the judge because even Trump appointed judges have issued him scathing rebukes like in 2020 when federal judge Stefanos Bibas said, quote, charges of unfairness are serious, but calling an election unfair does not make it so. Charges require specific allegations and then proof. We have neither here. Does data actually matter? Does truth actually matter? There was so much talk about the election being stolen by Democrats, despite the mountain of evidence that demonstrates otherwise. Trump lawyers like Rudy Giuliani never had a case and admitted so in court. Fox News paid Dominion voting machines almost a billion dollars in a settlement for their baseless accusations that the machines were rigged. And despite the Trump administration filing 62 lawsuits attempting to overturn the election results of 2020, 61 of them were defeated. But you won't hear that at America Fest. Instead, you hear a lot of talk with a lot of missing facts to spin a narrative that says the deep state is stealing America away from you. With four years of peace and prosperity, and then to get 74 million votes and have it stolen by the deep state and the globalist. Again, who exactly is the deep state? 
Joe Biden? Liberals? Which liberals? How? Where? You'll never know. It seems to be intentionally so broad that anyone can fill in the blanks for themselves. The same goes with words like woke, which seem to be the event's biggest sponsor, frankly. There were books about how to fight the war on woke. You could shop, quote, woke free. And of course, there was a breakout session called How to End Wokeism in the Church. But again, what exactly does this word woke mean? Well, we know it's been appropriated from black culture and turned into this catch-all term for anything that is liberal? Terms are so loosely defined that it seems they have lost all meaning, which is ironic considering that's a charge levied by groups like this at, quote, woke culture that really has no definition and can be anything to anyone. And it does really seem like data is either misleading or absent from much of the rhetoric. America is dying despite our economy growing. There is evil trying to destroy America, ambiguous and incredibly selective. Our values are under attack as 10,000 people gather to say whatever they want without the fear of government retribution. I mean, honestly, forgive me for saying the obvious, but it's incredibly hard for me to believe the conviction of someone like Tucker Carlson, who preaches this kind of message, yet is worth $30 million and says whatever he wants. This man literally interviewed Andrew Tate, one of the most misogynistic and abusive men in the public light today, and Tucker essentially gave him a pass in his interview to spread his bullshit. But Tucker's values are under attack? Where? He's a celebrity in America. The same goes for Charlie Kirk and many of the other speakers. Another example of the kind of dualism that exists in the rhetoric is the insistence from folks like Charlie to have as many kids as young as possible. And you say, boy, you know, what do I want to do for my life? Honestly, you should get married as young as possible and have as many kids as possible. Period. Reject the siren song of modernity. Yet he himself, despite being 30, only has one child and got married recently. And by the way, I fully support people getting married when they want, including later on in life. Charlie spent his 20s building a massive organization. In that sense, good for him. I'm glad he didn't cave to any potential pressure to get married at 21 and have a bunch of kids. But it must be noted that Charlie's life hardly reflects the values he espouses here, but somehow that doesn't matter. And this focus on children was reinforced by another speaker named Benny Johnson. Listen to what he said. Young men, we're just going to cut right to it. If you want to be an immovable mountain in your life. If you wish to be a strong alpha, I beg you, find a woman, fall in love, get married, have more children than you can afford, have insane amounts of kids. There's nothing the world can do to shake you if you do those simple steps. And if you acknowledge that God loves you and has a purpose for your life, that's it. That's it, and you are immovable. I have never heard such bad advice. Have more children than you can afford with what health care? If you can't afford to take care of your children, then why would you have more? Are you supposed to take out a loan, get another job? If the family ideal is one man and one woman with the man being the breadwinner and the woman staying at home to watch the kids, what job is the man in this scenario supposed to get in order to provide for all of this and also be a dad who is present in his kid's life? The federal minimum wage hasn't changed in decades, and according to Charlie, college is a scam, so you shouldn't get a degree, but yet you're supposed to build this idealized family unit at age 22? And don't people in this space look down on men who can't provide for their families and call them lazy, weak, and beta males? Oh, also, I should mention here that according to Jason Whitlock, back in the day when America protected the family unit, it was one vote per household. And, and I will defend life before suffrage because a vote used to represent the family. When we were a culture that really valued family and really understood the natural order that God intended, man serving God, woman following man who serves God, man and woman developing and nurturing children, you only needed one vote per household. I really don't know if most women at the event would agree with Jason, but let's be clear. This was espoused not in a small breakout session, but from the main stage in front of thousands of people. And again, this rhetoric collapses in on itself when you realize how many women speak at this event who have very successful careers and are most likely the breadwinner of the family. And again, to be very clear, I fully support women doing whatever they want in life. But in a space where the role of a woman is idealized as being a good wife and stay-at-home mom, I can't help but see the hypocrisy of Ali's 
Stucky and Candace Owens on the stage. Both of these commentators rail against feminism while benefiting from the hard-fought gains of feminism. They both have net worths in the millions, and it's just very hard to understand if these are actual values or if they're talking points that rally a base. But I guess when Trump is your leader, it's more of a do as I say, not as I do type of mentality. At the end of that clip from Benny, he reiterates a popular idea that God loves you and has a purpose for your life. Charlie, in his opening speech, also emphasized the importance of faith and even gave a sermon of sorts at the Strong Church Worship Night on Sunday. Some instruction manual that you reference, am I acting correctly? Am I marrying correctly? Am I living life well? You see, for me, and for those of us that call ourselves born-again Christians, it's the Word of God. It is the Bible. It is the totality. It answers every question. Why are we here? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Boom! Your existence is not a mistake, everybody. And are, are you a clump of cells that accidentally came into existence over millions of years of Darwinian evolution? Genesis 126 and 127. And God made us in his image. We are image bearers of the divine. And therefore, by the way, that means every single life born and unborn must be protected, regardless of how big that life is. And let me say this. If you are a pastor and you are not speaking out for pro-life ideas and policies and politicians, you should resign from the ministry because every pastor needs to be speaking out about abortion in their church. Okay. The Christian faith was all over the place at America Fest, and for me, this is the most important piece of it, the faith element. Now, some people I spoke to insisted this was not a Christian event. I disagree. When the founder of the organization gives an opening speech insisting that America was founded on biblical principles and brags that the faith wing of the organization is organizing pastors across the country while insisting it's not about being political but being biblical, this is a Christian event. There were several breakout sessions with pastors discussing the role of Christians in government and an entire strong church worship night on Sunday that dedicated several hours of time on the main stage thanking God for the event with speeches by Charlie Kirk, Eric Metaxas, who, by the way, in his book, Letter to the American Church, compares pastors who hung Nazi flags in their buildings with pastors who hang Black Lives Matter and Pride flags in theirs today, and of course, Ali Suckey, a prominent Christian conservative media pundit on the Blaze Network. And this is where the event really lost me. On Sunday late afternoon, Steve Bannon spoke. I don't have time to get into all of it, but here are a few clips from his speech. Are they going to give you your country back? Are they going to pat you on the head and say, yeah, you can take it from the deep state. You can take it from the administrative state. Are they going to give it to you? Are you going to have to take it? Washington Post, you are a dangerous scum. Let me change that. Let me change that. You are a dangerous vermin. If anything happens to Trump or there's any move on Trump, you people will pay. The southern border, 9 million illegal alien invaders in this country. Yeah, they're, they're, they're demons. They're, they're demons. They hate you for your beliefs, neoliberal, neocon Nikki. You don't love her? She's ambitious as Lucifer. That viper over there, that'd be worse than Judas Pence in the West Wing, wouldn't it? You're not fans of Nikki? You're not fans of Nikki as VP? This is oh my lord this is not pg rated both steve and i thought the crowd was chanting fuck her steve thought it was great I was horrified. It turns out the crowd was yelling Tucker, as in Tucker Carlson, but the point remained. Steve's speech was full of dehumanization, including calling Nikki Haley as ambitious as Lucifer. And literally 25 minutes after that, a worship band got on the stage to lead worship to God. Hey, America Fest, how are we doing tonight? Hey, we're Generation Worship, and we are excited to worship with you. And what he's done, there's no other possible response but to worship, but to give him all the honor, all the praise tonight. Because the word tells us that we lift our hands, we lift our hearts, and that's a sign of surrender. Praise. 
And this is where I have to ask the obvious. Exactly what Jesus are we following here? What Jesus is Charlie following that would approve of him mocking other people like this? And I think this picture is a perfect picture of a left-wing male. You know, they want a guy with a lisp zipping around on a lime scooter with a fanny pack, carrying his birth control, supporting his wife's career while he works as a supportive stay-at-home house husband. He has, a, he has a playlist that is exclusively Taylor Swift. And their idea of strength is this beta male's girl girlfriend opening a pickle jar just for him. At Turning Point USA, we resoundingly reject this. We believe in strong, alpha, godly, high T, high achieving, confident, well armed, and disruptive men are the hope, not the problem, in America. I can't emphasize enough the level of dehumanization that was peppered throughout this event. Vivek Ramaswamy told a CNN contributor to, quote, shut the fuck up to a round of applause. You got this character Van Jones on CNN afterwards saying, this is the rise of an American demagogue who's going to live 50 years longer than Trump. This is dangerous. Just shut the fuck up. <laughs> At a certain point, just shut the fuck up. There was a constant vilification of political opponents as demonic. It was emphasized over and over that, that this wasn't a political battle. It was a battle against good versus evil. One could even make the case that this was a new religion entirely. One that used Christian language like the love of God, Jesus, preaching the gospel, and being biblical, but with very different definitions. I think this highlights the difference. Well, what is the gospel? I mean, according to Jesus, not according to all these yahoos today we have, According to Jesus, it was to make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything that he commanded. Even this question of what is the gospel changes depending on who you ask. Is the gospel the death and resurrection of Christ, or is it to make disciples? And since when does make disciples mean take over areas of influence? If we are saved through faith and not by works, then no amount of moral deeds or laws will actually save people. This is pretty standard evangelical teaching, by the way, and yet it gets completely cast aside and the gospel gets redefined to justify why Christians like them need to take over society. So if we're actually going to preach the gospel, if we're going to live out the gospel, we're going to do that in every area of the culture, business, politics, the arts, all of it. And the Bible is, as, as Charlie so eloquently said last night, the instruction manual for life. But even if that was the gospel, which we could argue about, what did Jesus actually teach? Love your enemies? Turn the other cheek? If you look at a woman with lust, gouge out your eye? Clothe the naked? Take care of the sick? How you read the teachings of Jesus and come away with, stop trans people from accessing healthcare, or destroy our enemies is beyond me. Living out the gospel and Christian nationalism seems to be code for taking over the seven areas of influence with these far-right ideas. Whenever you quote these, uh, people think you're a dominionist. If you don't know what a dominionist is, don't worry about it, but I've been accused of being one. I'm not. Uh, but if you invoke these, and, and what they are is they're sociological barometers, uh, measuring points, and you have education, you have family, you have business, you have politics, religion, um, or arts and entertainment, media, yeah. And, and all of those move a culture. I also need to really emphasize how abused and misused the term biblical is in these spaces. The Bible is not the instruction manual for life, despite what Charlie might say. And if it was, the question is then which parts? Is it biblical to have multiple wives like David did? Is it biblical to wipe out the men, women, and children of a nation because God gave you the land? Is it biblical to love your enemy? Is it biblical to insist that rich business owners who withhold wages from their workers are in danger of judgment? And more importantly, which of these biblical values are societal mandates for America and which ones aren't. Biblical carries all of that weight and somehow gets reduced down to every single right-wing cause possible. It's not biblical to make sure everyone has affordable health care, but it is biblical to make sure that queer people don't have access to health care. It's not biblical to welcome the immigrant, but it is biblical to push a racist conspiracy theory that says non-European immigrants are flooding our society to destroy us. It's not biblical to advocate for tax policies that tax the ultra-wealthy 
and corporations who are hoarding wealth while their neighbors suffer, but it is biblical to blame the poor for not working hard enough. You get the point. One thing that must be emphasized in this video is how often truth was talked about at America Fest. Truth was all over the place, and what I couldn't get over was the insistence that there is just one truth while at the same time believing so many things that were demonstrably untrue. I think a lot of men and women and families are like, this is enough. This is not normal. And then they'll say, well, this is the new normal. No, 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 no. There is one normal. There is one truth. So I have a feeling that we're getting to the point where it's coming to a head. And we need to make sure that we're stabilizing things because things are getting completely out of control. There is one normal. There is one truth. This far right world emphatically believes not an opinion or perspective necessarily, but that there is one way to live their way, and anything or anyone else who lives differently is a threat to their existence. Let me remind you that there is no push anywhere in America to destroy heterosexual families. All that's happening is a culture that's recognizing that families look different and representing that in media, and politicians recognizing that people are diverse and their rights and family structures should be protected too. But even just acknowledging that there are families that don't look like theirs is somehow perceived as an attack on them and family values. This is all tied back to the mantra that if the nation prays and does the will of God via what's in the word, everything is going to be okay. As these bad things are happening in our country right now, people are pouring into this hope bucket. And that hope is Jesus Christ. God's will is in the word. And if we stay in the word every day, we can be proactive in prayer as a nation that will line up with God's will. And it's going to be absolutely amazing. Ironically, that was said in that clip I just shared by Mike Lindell, a man who staked his entire reputation on the baseless claim that the election was stolen. A verifiably untrue statement, but in this world, the truth seems to be upside down. Events like this are heavy on rhetoric and light on solution and facts. A point of frustration for me, truly, was hearing Christian leaders emphasize the problem of sexual indoctrination and grooming of children happening at places like Drag Queen Story Hour or schools because the library had a sex ed book designed for queer students. Two things on this. First, it is ironic to hear the same people who get mad that the definition of marriage has changed literally redefine what it means to be a groomer for their political cause. And second, to this day, I am not aware of one single story of a child being molested at Drag Queen Story Hour, but I can give you many examples of pastors who molested kids. When you realize that statistically, the majority of kids who are sexually abused are done so by someone they know, and only 7% of the time it's a strange you have to once again ask yourself, how firm is this foundation of truth they claim to be standing on? Is there a widespread epidemic of children being groomed by queer people so they can be assaulted? No. The data is so absolutely clear on this, but that doesn't seem to matter. What matters is that being queer goes against the Bible, therefore it's sinful, therefore it goes against God's design, therefore it goes against nature, and therefore queer people must be more deviant than heterosexual people. Despite this being false and numerous studies demonstrating that gay and bisexual men are not any more likely to molest children, this crowd replays the same rhetoric from literally the 70s about queer people while staying silent on the rampant abuse documented in evangelical spaces that actually hurt children. I also need to note here that a Turning Point Faith Pastor Summit that happened in May, which I also attended, did have a sponsor whose founder was a registered sex offender. Once again, I get the impression that it's more about rhetoric than actual data. And it's very difficult to keep up with the mandates for moral piety versus the morality of the politicians they endorse or the people they have in a sponsor booth. You are supposed to be married to one spouse, have lots of kids and be a God-fearing patriot, but you're supposed to vote for a man who was literally found liable of sexually assaulting a woman or or the woman who recently divorced her husband, or the other woman who before she divorced her husband was caught on camera at an all ages play of Beetlejuice filling up her date. You get my point. Of course, these moral issues aren't that big of a deal because good Christians vote for the commander in chief, not a pastor in chief. You know, how can you vote for a president who's been three times married, twice divorced? Um, and, and I just tell him, I said, I'm not voting for a pastor in chief. I'm voting for a commander in chief and a bodyguard for Western civilization. But is Trump even a good commander in chief? He's been documented to be a serial liar. And the man is saying things that should send a shiver down anyone's spine. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. They poison mental institutions and prisons all over the world, not just in South America, not just the three or four countries that we think about, but all over the world. They're coming into our country from Africa, from Asia, all over the world. They're pouring into our country. 
Again, I must ask these pastors with all due respect, where in the teachings of Jesus do you find the justification for calling other humans made in the image of God poison to a society? A line eerily similar to the Adolf Hitler quote about Jews poisoning the blood of others. I could make an entire video showing clip after clip of Trump using language of authoritarians. He made a joke that he'd only be a dictator on day one, has vowed to go after his political enemies if elected president, and tells his followers that he is their retribution. This is what Christian nationalism is all about. While Jesus taught his followers to bear crosses for their enemies, Christian nationalism is in the business of building crosses for theirs. It is steeped in antichrist behavior that is clearly contrary to the way of Jesus. Perhaps one way to sum up how Christian nationalism works is to show you this picture of a hoodie someone was wearing that said, quote, Jesus was accused of insurrection too. Christian nationalism compares Jesus, the Messiah, to a Messiah of their own making and rips the Jesus story completely out of its context and maps it onto something incredibly foreign to the text. Let me remind you that, that the followers of Jesus thought he was here to take earthly power and to overthrow the empire, but instead he says that his kingdom is not of this world. In my opinion, Christian nationalism worships a Jesus who actually bows the knee and kisses the ring in exchange for the ability to rule over the nations. Not a Jesus who told his followers that the kingdom was subversive, like a mustard seed, and comes from the most unlikely places. So often, the critique of people like myself is that because we change our positions on certain political issues, we don't take the Bible seriously. However, I reject that and believe that it is instead Christian nationalism that has a low view of Scripture. They don't seem very concerned with understanding the context of Scripture or understanding the very complicated history of how we got our modern Bible. They flatten out the Bible to be literal and, quote, make it the instruction manual for life, despite that not being a claim of the text. The Bible is a compilation of 66 books that each have very complicated histories. To read Genesis in the same voice as Romans is doing the text a disservice. In a roundabout weird way, this isn't even about the fact that I disagree on some key issues, although that is certainly important. This is about the level of vitriol and hate that is thrown around at events like this in the name of love. There is mockery on every level from the people on stage saying things like this. So clinically insane people are currently inside the White House right now. I think we have a live shot of this. Can we can we go to it? Let's let's go see. Here, okay. Wow. Oh no. Oh my God. Oh, this is terrible. Oh, this is so, this is so bad for our nation. To having a sponsor selling, quote, woke tears water. Cordiality is out the window. This is about retribution and, frankly, reclaiming America for the true Americans, them. Pluralism, freedom for all, and democracy are not what's important here. Taking America back for God and for true patriots is. With politeness and respect out the window from the platform, what about off the platform? It's honestly a completely different story. People I met were as nice as pie, and I met a lot of people, including Turning Point staff and prominent names in the movement. Some recognized me from last year and asked how my family was doing. So kind of them. Some even told me that they appreciated me being there and said we need to bridge the political divide by having conversations and finding common ground. Truly, whiplash again, but I was here for it. And this brings me to some moments of hope. Regardless of the endless amount of anger preached from the main stage, many people people truly seemed hungry to find some kind of civility. Yes, I know what you're thinking. How can people say that when the whole event was all about supporting their presidential champion who acts the opposite? I still don't understand how people cannot see this disconnect, but I digress. I spent most of my time at the event talking to people trying to find some common ground, and honestly, there was some. Many people I spoke to were feeling the pressure from an economy that just isn't cutting it for them. I agree. Yes, I know. I know the Biden talking point that the economy is growing, and that might be statistically true, but my grocery bill is still high. Housing is insanely unaffordable. Buying a car is out of reach, and healthcare costs are still out of control. I understand there are a lot of things that affect this, okay? And one man can't wave a magic wand, but the point does stand regardless. Many did express their frustration with the top 1% controlling so much. In fact, I'm not sure if you know this, but just six companies control 90% of all media. That is is concerning, flat out. I share and understand the concerns about who controls narrative and information, and in many ways, I think independent media needs to be strong and robust. But when you claim to be independent media and you spread bogus conspiracy theories around in the name of truth, it hurts everyone in this space trying to do good work. In fact, we ourselves are working on evolving our content strategy to have more consistent commentary on politics, culture, and theology from a Jesus-centered, inclusive perspective. But it seems like there is a massive delta between what I think think the source of the problem is and what they think it is. Take this clip from Matt Gates, for example. 61% of Americans today are living paycheck to paycheck. 
Think about buying a car. You could be paying twice the amount in interest that you would have been paying just a few years ago. We've got more Americans in default on their home mortgages than at any other time in the last decade. Everything is not awesome. I think a lot of us can find agreement on the problems here, but where's the talk of record corporate profits that are absolutely sucking up wealth from the middle and lower class? When your mantra is small government and less regulation, you end up advocating for a system that creates so much of the problems you're campaigning on. However, when you're having this discussion over drinks, people are more willing to hear you out. I had some great talks with people finding common ground over issues like this while being able to challenge them on things like, how exactly is it pro-family to have a stagnant federal minimum wage, privatized health care with insane deductibles that's tied to your job, and no access to affordable child care. Demographically, the crowd was more diverse in ways you might not expect. While I don't have percentages, I would say there was a healthy dose of diversity both in the crowd and on the stage. There were a lot of younger people in their mid-20s or younger. While I know statistically Gen Z is more progressive than ever, there is still a remnant that sees themselves as countercultural by being in movements like this. And as someone who grew up in the conservative evangelical world, I can totally relate. I also want to give credit to Turning Point USA for providing a guide for a blind man the entire time and for also having a tent set up for nursing mothers who want a privacy. What makes events like this so complicated is that you realize that you're dealing with human beings. These aren't robots, they're not all angry white men screaming 24-7. They're humans and like any other human, they're not one-dimensional. They have families, personalities, and are into pop culture despite how much they think America is going woke. This is the dissonance I struggle with reconciling. On one hand, it's clear Trump is their guy, a man who calls immigrants poison, a man who was found liable for sexually assaulting a woman, who has abused the court system to avoid accountability, and who vows vengeance on his political enemies. And not only does he have their support in the name of policy, he has their support in the name of God. That is troubling, flat out. And even after being deeply embedded in these spaces, having countless conversations with leaders, asking them directly, how do you reconcile the Jesus of the Sermon on the Mount and Trump, I am left unpersuaded and unimpressed. There are cognitive gymnastics that you must do in order to justify not just your tolerance, but your unwavering support of a man who is hell-bent on his political gain, no matter the cost, and who refuses to admit wrongdoing of any sort. On the other hand, they can be open, kind, and willing to reason despite their political preferences causing so much of the damage that fuels their rage. The bottom line is this. We're on the same planet with these people, and many of us are in the same nation as them. I believe this requires a both-and approach. We must resist their rhetoric and policy policies these groups are pushing 100%. But we also cannot forget the humanity. The second we start to see people who attend America Fest as the other and less than human, we start heading down a path that will only end in more chaos. I believe as people claiming to be followers of Jesus, we must have a posture that invites our enemies, so to speak, to the table so we can talk. I didn't change my views because people screamed at me online. I was changed because people asked me good faith questions and befriended me, treating me as an equal. I believe on the grassroots level, as much as we're able to, this must be the way forward while doing everything we can to make sure that the policies we advocate for protect the rights of all of our neighbors instead of privileging the Christian nationalist ones. 2024 is going to be a vital year to protect democracy and the rights of all of our neighbors. We as a nonprofit organization believe we must be a louder voice that builds a coalition of credible voices to combat Christian nationalism and to offer a better path forward in our faith. As much as this is political, it's also theological and many media outlets don't understand the world of Christian nationalism, but we do because many of us were part of it. Millions of people have left the church not because they couldn't follow Jesus, but because they felt their churches abandoned them in the name of saving America. I hear stories like this all the time. This is why we have developed a plan and strategy to produce more content like this. It's called Project Amplify, and it's a massive expansion of our content strategy that involves hiring a team to produce high quality content that pushes for a more inclusive, loving society and Christianity. We have a team and so many contributors ready and standing by, all we need is the fuel to make it a reality. If you want to support this endeavor, click the link below to donate so we can make this a reality and be the change we want to see. Thank you so much for watching. I would love your thoughts. Leave a comment below and make sure to subscribe to the channel. Let's raise our voices together and donate now.